my name's Dina Romero and I'm standing in North East Somerset and Hannah. So I am Edmund Cannon. I'm the Green Party candidate for North East Somerset and Hannah. I'm Paul MacDonald. I am the candidate for Reform UK for the constituency of North East Somerset and Hannah. Uh, my name's Dom Tristram. I am the Green Party candidate for Bath. I'm Theresa Hall. I'm candidate uh, for Reform UK in Bath. Yeah, my, my name is Colin Blackburn. I'm an independent. I'm, I don't believe in party politics. How will you gain student trust? Well, I think the first thing to do is to be really open about the reason why I think we lost a lot of um, trust from students. So um, we made a, a big commitment to... Um, to not increase uh, tuition fees um, and rather than that and I think actually our commitment might have been to um, to abolish uh, tuition fees but uh, what we did instead was um, as part of our arrangement with the Conservatives uh, when we went into coalition unfortunately the fees were raised and, and quite significantly i would say that one thing that we were able to do at the time was to um at least ensure that tuition fees didn't have to be paid up front and they were paid after after a student had graduated so which i know is not um not necessarily you know the the best outcome but i guess it's better than it it could have been but i would you know, I apologise um, for for going uh, for that, but yeah, I guess in in a way, perhaps we went into that coalition rather naively, and you know, definitely, I think lessons lessons were learned. But what I would like to do now for the future is, I think the first thing to do is to talk to students and to find out truly what. What is it that matters to students? You know, I've done a bit of a straw poll talking to students that I, I know, and I think the you know, environment is one key issue that um, students are very uh, passionate about, but, um, and some more immediate issues such as housing, such as you know, the issues around rents, particularly the sky high rents that uh, students are charged in that first year when they don't really get a choice about which which housing they are going into so a lot go into purpose-built student accommodation and whether or not that's on site at the universities or off-site the, the one complaint I hear time and time again is how high those rents are and therefore it, it has an impact because that in the second year and, and the further years, students are more likely not to want to stay in, in that um, purpose-built student accommodation and move into cheaper accommodation, often shared housing. And that has an impact um, for you know, communities at, at, you know, generally, but it also has a, a problem, I think, for students when they leave university, particularly in a place like um, Bath and in North East Somerset, because that that housing is no longer available for them to to rent as their or sorry to, to buy or rent as their first um, as their first housing as well. So it feels like it's a, a bit of a vicious um, cycle, and I would like to do something to 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 change that to perhaps challenge the. Um, you know, to, to challenge the, the, the sort of principles behind why that, that, that is, seems to be the, the case. So, um, so housing and the environment, um, as you'll probably be well aware, the environment, you know, we are, um, you know, we have very strong green credentials. Uh, and mo most recently, we've been fighting against sewage being poured into our rivers uh, and the seas. And I, I know, um, They've been a council in Bath and North East Somerset for a number of years. How important, you know, rivers are for our, um, for students, for young people. You know, think about Warley Weir and places like like that, um, and in Salford as well, where you know young people like to just kind of like hang out and uh, you know get in in the water and cool off a bit. You know, on on days when it is super sunny, like it's been over the last couple of days, slightly less so now. Um, so, but. You know, maybe that was a little bit of a, um, uh, so to say, sort of not particularly deep um, issue around, uh, you know, being in the water, but actually around recycling, around, you know, doing more, around encouraging, um, you know, skills in the 
in um, in the green industries as well. So an awful lot of uh, scope in in that um, in that area, I think, for the immediate future for for students yeah, and also uh, for the the longer term future as well. Uh, and another issue I think matters to students um, is around the wars, particularly Gaza and Israel. Um, but also all the other conflicts are happening, you know, Afghanistan, Ukraine, etc. So I'd like, um, you know, to be able to do what we say, which is, uh, you know, particularly calling for a ceasefire and um, to try and build, you know, just a, a, a better global place as well. Um, what else? So, so these are things that I, believe are important to students but I'm very happy to be corrected and if students have other issues that they want to share then I really would like to talk to students. One thing I would like to do um, if I am elected is actually to form some sort of um, kind of student body that actually talks to me directly and says actually this policy great but actually this is how it affects students you know I know we've been talking as a party around having more access to mental health uh, practitioners so and I know also at Basketball University you've got um, a really good um, offer around mental health support as well so you know I'd like to sort of tie these things up a bit um, and see whether or not we can make these things more, more commonplace as well uh, let me think what else I would like to say on this subject. I think that's, oh, and obviously we're the only party as far as I'm aware that is, um, would like to forge stronger links with Europe as well. So, you know, I know that Barcelona University quite recently has been picking up some of the links uh, that the city of Bath has with some of our twin cities. Um, such as Braunschweig, there was very recently a visit uh, to Basbar University from um, uh, um, the, um, the mayoral group um, from Braunschweig. And I would like to sort of increase those links, not but just with that country, but with other countries across across Europe and indeed the, the globe, building on that international reputation that Basbar has as a university as well. Um, well, I think, you know, I, I think... Um... There are there are two things I'd say. Um, the first is that you know um, various parties are making promises about what they'll do, <clears throat> and of course there's there's always a sense in which you can promise to do something, but then when you get into power, circumstances might change. Uh, but but the question is, do you do you believe that the promises made are credible and that people really mean what they say? So the Green Party has you know fairly uh, compared with the other parties, fairly bold plans to increase public spending. Um, we have explained how we shall raise the money. The, the numbers um, add up uh, as much as these numbers ever add up. So one, as a student, you can look at it and you say, okay, the Green Party are promising something. They're promising something which is different from what other people are doing, but the numbers add up. And you know, other parties have made other promises, and some of those promises may be less convincing. For example, it's very difficult to see how one could cut taxes without having to have devastating cuts in public services, which, which are implausible. Um, uh, the second thing is that as a party, we are not beholden to big business. We don't take large donations from businessmen. We're not beholden to trade unions either, anything. I mean, one of the reasons, you know, we, we only take relatively small donations. Uh, so we are not going to be, um, we're not going to be blown off by, by some big donor saying, well, I've given you the money, now you have, to, uh, you have to do this. And we're not going to be subconsciously thinking, well, we're too scared to introduce this policy because we know we're relying upon this donor. And even though this donor hasn't said anything, we don't want to upset them. Well, I think there are a number of policies. I mean, let me just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a number of policies in, in how we how we are approaching uh, students, um, third level students. Uh, we're arguing that um, interest rates on students' loan on student loans should be should be scrapped. Mm -hmm. That's in combination with other reforms we're looking for from universities. So we want universities, for example, to 
offer two-year courses that people can qualify in rather mm -hmm. than having to necessarily do, do, uh, do, do three-year courses. Um, we're also bearing down, or we're quite keen to bear down on universities that, in our view, restrict um, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Um, I'm, I myself am something of an American First Amendment fundamentalist. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a believer in, in the First Amendment. I mean, of course, there are, if, you, if you speak, you have to, of course, mind a couple of things. You, you know, you're inciting, inciting violence against people individual is, is, a, is a criminal offense. Um, and of course, if you libel somebody, you have to be ready to be sued. <laughs> um, so, you know, and obviously threatening people is, is a criminal offense. But other than that, I, I'm very, very, um, I'm very pro free speech. So to, to, to give an example, I, I had a correspondence from um, a Jewish gentleman who was representing um, a, an organization um, representing the interest of Israel in particular, and Jews generally, and, and whilst I didn't see any, I didn't have any problem in, in any of his agenda, you know, I think Israel has a right to exist. I did point out to him that, you know, there are people, for example, who are taking a, a very pro-Israel stance in the whole uh, Gaza war, and they are trying to criminalize um, speech, for example, against, against uh, what they see as Zionism. Now, I, I pointed out to him that I would be against any criminalization of people even for, you know, e I mean, even for views that, that, that might be described as racist. Um, so my opinion about this tends to even think that some of the current law is not necessarily valid, not necessarily a good idea. I have more, I have more of an American approach. You know, in, in America, the, the First Amendment is extremely powerful. And if, if we could have one here, I would support it. We think that students, we think that universities should, should provide uh, shorter courses Okay, um, yes. In general, in, in general, I think your demographic, as in people, you know, of your age group, have been very badly screwed over by the system. Um, and I think that's because we have had in the last 30 years massive asset price inflation in the form of house prices. Uh, this is, is really a consequence of governments, you know, rescuing banks, pumping money into the economy, um, which I think was too, my personal view is that, 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 that this was too indiscriminate, too generous. Some banks should have been allowed to go bust. Um, and I think it's also a consequence of a planning system that we have that's extremely slow and, and provides a sort of right of veto over future residents of areas, by existing residents of areas. And whilst I understand people are anxious about, you know, a new housing estate being built, you know, in an area which they might regard as a, an area of great natural beauty, we, you know, the, the, I think the pendulum has gone too far against younger people. Housing needs to be affordable and it needs to be affordable to buy for younger people. Uh, and that is really a sort of act of suicide on the part of um, policymakers if they don't actually allow that to happen. So, uh, There's something I feel very strongly about. Now, there is a case I think for insisting that house builders um, and apartment builders improve their design standards. A lot of the stuff being built in Britain is not, you know, the vernacular architecture is quite ugly. And I think this, as much as anything else, sort of put, puts people off agreeing to, to, to new development. Um, unlike many in my party, I'm something of a modernist. Um, I rather like modern, modern architecture, <laughs> but I suspect a lot of people in, in Reform UK, you know, don't or think they don't. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of modern architecture and um, uh, I think it can be done very, very well, very nice. And um, so we need to make planning easier. We need to insist on better design and we need to increase the quantity of housing. It is slightly related, I think, to the somewhat, you know, somewhat more sensitive issue of, of immigration and migration and so on. I mean, the rates of immigration into Britain have increased enormously since Tony Blair's time. And whatever the rights and wrongs of that, that has put enormous pressure on resources, things like housing, rents and so on. Because uh, that obviously it hasn't been, it hasn't been, it, it, these haven't been allowed to catch up. So we do need to, we, we need to, I think, reset our migration policy. I mean, forget about even what you know, Reform UK is saying. Just think about the way it was before Tony Blair. You know, under previous Labour governments, before Tony Blair. You know, all countries have rational migration policies. If you try and immigrate, if you try and emigrate to India, you know, you will you will find out very quickly 
that the Indians don't, don't just deny anybody to commit to their country. They will, they will A, they, they will stop you from buying property, <laughs> any kind of property. I mean, they, they've all sorts of restrictions on foreign nationals, as do most countries, um, which restrict foreign nationals uh, from coming in. So we have to get a grip on that. But of course, this is a blended problem. We obviously have the issue of, of migrants coming across the channel um, as well, and, and, and how we deal with that. In a way, these are probably, there are probably issues that can be separated out um, rather than treat it all just as, you know, immigration. Um, but I, I think our, I think even our legal, our legal immigration has been a big problem because businesses and corporate interests have encouraged and supported very easy migration of, of people with low skills and low wages to come into the country in large numbers because it's essentially a, a, a cheap labor for them. Uh, there's a similar process in America you know, where Democrats, very often wealthy Democrats, are very pro allowing in migrants very, very, who can work very, very cheaply. And they do it under the guise of a human rights argument. But in, in reality, there's also a strong economic self-interest at play for, for the wealthy to have access to cheap labor and to debase, as it were, uh, the sort of labor earned by the industrial proletariat, to use the old Marxist term. Well, I'd, I'd say you say recently, I say is, I mean, I'm, I'm quite old and um, going back to 2010, um, that's when I noticed distrust because the Lib Dems went into that election saying that they would not, um, that they would scrap tuition fees or they wouldn't increase them. Or something. I can't remember exactly what they promised, but then they went into coalition with the Conservatives, which was the start of this 14 years. Um, and they lost a lot of trust in students. And I think also dangerously politicians in general, because even though that was just one party that said that, you know, they made this solemn pledge and they broke it and they didn't even really seem to really mind breaking it. And I think a lot of people saw that and thought, well, why should we trust anything that politicians say? Um, which reflects very badly on the, I mean, you know, I'm a politician and I'm in that, I'm lumped together with people like that. And um, all the way through, you know, from that election and beforehand, we've been saying, you know, scrap student fees, um, you know, write off loans and all that sort of stuff. And people will say to us, oh, yeah, but Nick Clegg said all that sort of thing. And he went back on it. So you're sort of judged on somebody else's actions. So I can see why students are slightly cynical when politicians say these things. But I guess I'd try and frame it like this. Um, the Lib Dems and the Tories are economically right-wing parties. The thing that separates them is the Lib Dems are um, socially liberal and, and, you know, but there's a place for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, they have a belief that the market is king. Um, and so when a party has that core belief, you have to wonder why they want education to be there. And I think in their case, education is to make you employable. You know, that they say, well, it's a thing the government gives you to, so that you can get a better job. So maybe you should pay for it because if you get a better, better job, you've got more money. It's, it's kind of they're adding up the costs and they're working out what they get back. Whereas a party like ours thinks education is there for the sake of education. Sure, it should give you a good job if that's what you want to do with it. But ultimately, what is living for if it's not about learning? You know, learning is part of being human and you shouldn't have to justify everything you do on the basis of the money you will earn from doing it. Um, so we very much have a view that a language around, and this comes from the Tories at, at the moment, especially, but also with some other parties, and you know, sadly also from Labour, they'll say, uh, oh, these Mickey Mouse degrees, which is a phrase I hate, you know, degrees which are pointless, or, and they'll often throw around things like, I don't know, theatre studies or media or something, you know, some arts degree, they'll pick on arts degrees, they nearly always do. And they'll say, well, what's the point of that? Because, you know, those people aren't going to get jobs. Well, that's untrue because actually unemployment is very low at the moment. So those people do get jobs. Um, do they all get jobs in the field that their degree was in? No, not always. But then you can't run universities like that. If you're just thinking, well, what jobs are there? And you're trying to guess four or five years into the future and say, well, we'll only let people do degrees that those jobs need. You, it, the whole thing would grind to a halt. You can't work like that. The only way you can really operate higher education is to let people do what they want to do. It's got to be an interest. And then hopefully those people want to do a job in that field and a degree will help them. And maybe then they won't do a job in that field, but that's not the point. The point is you've enhanced them and their lives as a person. Now, this might say, oh, it sounds all very kind of happy, clappy and you know, hippie and isn't that great? 
But ultimately, graduates do pay back more anyway, even if they don't get jobs in that field, they will tend to earn more and they'll tend to pay more tax over time. So the whole argument that they have to pay for their degree is kind of, it's not a real argument anyway, because they generally do. Um, and if they don't, so so be it. You know, what are we saying? We're we saying we should only fund things that have a return. So why are we funding A-levels? Why are we even funding secondary schools? You know, you, you can bring that argument all the way back to only the only clever people should be funded for education. I mean, that's what they're saying. So you'd be saying, no, let's everyone fulfill their full potential. And if you want to spend three years becoming an expert in some esoteric part of the arts, well, then good on you. And why shouldn't you be? Because actually the world is enhanced by these people who have an in-depth knowledge of culture. And the world is definitely enhanced by people who do the arts. Because, you know, you work hard all day, you come home, what do you want to do? You want, well, what, what do you do if you've got time and you haven't got small children? You sit back and you watch television or a film or something. Who makes those things? People who did arts degrees, you know, and that's ignoring the fact there's there's what, what they give us as, you know, to enhance our lives. And then there's the export. You know, Britain is, makes a huge amount of money in the arts, whether that's music or film or TV or theatre. It's a massive increase in our, our economy. So it's easy to pick on these things. It's easy to say everyone should do STEM subjects. But actually, sure, everyone, lots of people should do STEM subjects, but also the people who aren't interested in that, don't make them do it because they'll be they won't enjoy it and they won't make good employees if they do get that degree. Um, so this is a very long winded way of saying there's been an attack from the right generally on students and education. You know, they're trying to make it, they're trying to make it pay in quotes and sort of say you should, it's, it's all about getting a job. And we don't think that's, we think that's entirely the wrong way of thinking about it. It's not about work. It's about enhancing your life and it's about enhancing you as a person. And if everyone feels fulfilled and happy in their lives, then society will benefit. It's, it, you can't put the monetary value on a more educated, happier society. But we all know that that's nicer to live in. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I think everybody's lost faith in government. Um, and one of the things that... Uh, one of the things that made me join reform, when I decided to do something politically, I looked across the spectrum and reform was the only party that said anything slightly different to what everybody else was saying. They're all kind of trying to tweak the whole taxation thing and see how they can squeeze a little bit more blood out of that same stone. So, uh, and that same stone is the taxpayer. So. It's all stick. Like I said last night at the Hustings, it's all stick and no carrot. So I, the, the first year I went to college, they called the college, so it's now a uni, so I've got a degree. So I have been a student. I know your woes. It's not like, uh, like I don't. So that year was the year they froze the grants. So I went on a grant because I was a mature student and I had sustained myself for the previous last years. Those were the rules. And the grant, you know, I mean, we're talking about the late 80s. The grant was £3,000 a year. It wasn't really enough. I I remember on one particular desperate evening recycling the fag ends in my ashtray and going, oh, this one, this one looks like it's got quite a bit of life in it. <laughs> I'm sure I could get a couple of puffs out of this one. Anyhow, um, so I lived on a shoestring and I worked all summer long. Um, and that's how I survived. But it was something. And if that, that something hadn't have been there, I would never have gone to uni because I came I, I came from not a wealthy family. It's just we weren't wealthy, not wealthy enough to do what you guys are doing now, there is no way I would have taken on 40, 50, 60,000 pounds worth of debt. I wouldn't have done that. So that would have been the end of my university studies right there at the door. So, um, and I, and that was the only time I've been in a proper protest and I accidentally, I don't want to sound like a complete hero here. <laughs> We did get and we ended up getting chased by horses. We went all the way to London to protest, and the protest was uh, grants, not loans. That's what we protested. We weren't listened to. They've decided to go private, and unfortunately, not private. Private is one thing. It's huh, now you're in competition with foreign students. You as British students, 
I think that the foreign students should subsidize a British student. I don't know if that is mind boggling, but I think, you know, they're, they're willing to come here to study. That's great. I mean, obviously, I am for education, but um, the fact is, there's got to be a vehicle through which we've got to encourage our best to do their best. And facing them with 40 and 50,000 pounds worth of uh, debt is it's just paid slavery, isn't it? So I know people that have become 40 years old, they're still paying off their debts. They now want to get money together for a deposit to buy their house, to have families. This is costing us, it's not just the individual debt, it's what it does to the individual long term. So it seems to me, so I was in, still in education when they made education compulsory to 18. The reason behind that was, was just to take that chunk of the population out of the unemployment statistics. So suddenly, that chunk, two years worth of that generation, were no longer in the unemployment statistics. Instead, they were studying. And I can prove to you, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that this is not just me being a conspiracy theorist. There was no real vehicle. They were all studying photography. How many photographers does a nation need? So studies have also, they've got to be, how can I say? University education has to be not market-led, but need-led. So there's no point getting people into tens of thousands of debt for a job they're never going to do. If the job is not there, because at the end of the day, there's, there's nothing you can't read for yourself. If you just want a general education, just go to a library, knock yourself out. What you guys are looking for is a piece of paper that says, this is what I've learned. This is what I'm capable of doing. And the fact is you come out of university, not all of you, but some of you, you come out with a piece of paper that says something that means nothing to your employer. But at the same time, you guys are looking for 40, 45,000 pound jobs. There aren't many of those. Not for somebody who's got a theoretical degree, but no practical skill and knowledge. So I will win your trust by telling you, your education needs to be more practical. You need to tell an employer, this is what I can do. I didn't just go there to get drunk and have a lovely time and, you know, hang out with my mates. This is what I've learned. This is a skill you need and you can't be without. So it's not skills based, you know, it's not. I don't know what it is. Now, when I, I was, um, I used to rent some rooms out in my house and my first ever two lodgers, I remember them like it was, they were lovely kids, kids, sorry. So I don't want to sound patronizing, young people. They were lovely young people, both of them music graduates, funnily enough. It just so happened. They'd finished their studies in Bath and one was working at Boots and one was working at Marks and Spencers. You don't need a degree to do those jobs. Yeah. So, so first of all, and nobody's going to tell you otherwise because they're making money out of you. So first of all, your student unions, instead of getting you to go off and protest things that aren't under your control, <laughs> the, the, your student unions need to be looking out for your interests, for what's best for you. This has got to become a primary focus. You're not children, you're young adults. You need to think. You need to think what's going to happen in five, in 10, in 15 years time. What have I got to offer that somebody else hasn't? You know, and you're being you're being gazumped by uh, foreign workers because they come with a very um, a needle precise view of what they're doing it for. You know, they're very focused. Well, I think um, for, from my perspective is... I, I'm running um, for the position of MP in Bath because I feel that we are at a crossroads and party politics has ha, has lost a massive amount of faith throughout the country. Um, the the sound bites, the the, the 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 promises, the pledges of this, that, and the other, without genuinely digging into the detail, you know promising six and a half thousand new teachers when there are 24,000 schools is a bit of a sticking plaster because the one of the biggest problems is recruitment and retention of those teachers so which problem do you address first and I 
I genuinely feel my role in government would be uh, ultimately in opposition. I wouldn't be in government. And actually, interestingly for Bath, in the last 32 years, we've only actually had an MP in government for seven of those years. Five were in the coalition and two was a Conservative member from 2015 to 2017. Outside of that, we've we've always had a, an opposition and actually not the first level opposition MP. So the job is to, to debate, to scrutinise, to question and actually go into those committee rooms and engage with fellow politicians to, to drive the message. Bath in itself is quite a unique environment um, and, and different cities and different university cities have their own and different pressures. You know, we've got two non-city centre campuses. I know obviously Spa now have got the, the old Herman Miller building down at Locksbrook, um, you know, that logistically it's slightly different than it was a few years ago. But Bath's changed um, because of the growth of the university sector. Um, but that's very different than other cities. My, my Before I moved back down to Bath, I'd spent quite a few years up in Nottingham. I've got a sister-in-law who's a senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent. And, you know, I married into an education family. Um, and... Um, you know, uh, living just down the road from the main uni of Nottingham campus, it was great. It was a great place for me to go and run around um, and uh, get my exercise. But that city is so much bigger to absorb the number of students. So their needs or their pressures and how their representative may take their, their arguments to parliament would be different. Um, and I genuinely believe my understanding, hence I mentioned about knowing um, and being up at the Uni of Bath um, only recently and, and knowing a little bit about Spa, having lived in Corston when I first moved back just at the end of the roundabout. <laughs> and so um, I, I, you know, I've been reaching out to say that if I am that person who gets the nod from the, 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 the community, I've already spoken to the utilities, I've talked to the RUH, I've talked to Visit Bath and Bath Bid, I've, I've engaged with different levels and want to make sure that those problems and concerns are genuinely represented on that national stage. Why should our students vote not only for you, but for your party? Okay, well, I think I've covered some of what um, I wanted to say in my first answer, but um, obviously I'd like them to vote for me because I am the most marvellous, but obviously... <laughs> but um, I think... I would like them to vote for me uh, from the party because, you know, we have, you know, we I think we've really understood what things matter to um, the population. Um, so the cost of living crisis, again, this is another thing that is so um, applicable to students as well. You know, obviously the, the old image of students um, sort of struggling with, you know, um, uh, you know, to to feed themselves, I think is is particularly uh, relevant now as well. And it doesn't matter how many cool cookbooks you get on how to to feed a student for under a fiver. You know, if you don't have that fiver to start with, it's it's you know, it's it's a real it's a real worry. And that that um, that crisis is not just affecting students; it's affecting people who have what might have been considered you know um decent jobs but because food prices have gone up so much because fuel prices have gone up so much you know people are really really struggling so we need to find ways of fixing this we um wanted to introduce an energy cap um when the price of fuel was um suddenly went uh rocketing up uh, but we were uh pushed back from the, the, the by the government in, in doing so. Um, and I think we would want to do more to ensure that um, food, fuel, housing, all those things that people have to spend money on are, are made more reasonable and that um, people's wages can, can um, meet those costs and allow a little bit of you know extra as well because i don't think anybody wants just to to work to live is that the right way around live to work that you know what they want to do is, <laughs> yes, i mean you you want to have extra don't you you want to have something that means that you're all of your money isn't just going into surviving you want to be able to live as well um another area we we're working on is the national health crisis so we have a lot of um 
you know, lots and lots of um, evidence around how difficult it is for people to see uh, a doctor or a dentist, you know, long waiting lists for, you know, really, um, you know, some, you know, for conditions that actually need you to be able to see somebody urgently, you know, particularly, you know, cancer. Um, one area that for students I would like to address actually in the National Health Service um, setup is a way that students can be registered in two places because at the moment, as you will be aware, I'm sure, you, you get to choose between your, your home address where you're there for half the year or your student address where you are there for the other part of the year. So there must be a way, if you can register to vote in two places, there must be a way of, of enabling, um, you know, you to have access to GP ser um, services, uh, you know, depending where, where, you're, where you're living at that moment in time. Um, so what else would I like to, so that's, um, and what we also would want to do, I think, is to work on future employment as well, because I believe that there's, it feels to me that there's no guarantee that you will get a job despite having, you know, a really good degree. So what we, I think we will need to do is we need to work on um, that those opportunities so that um, students have, have that ability to go into work in something that they've been studying over the last three or four years, or even longer. Well, I think students, sh you know, everybody knows that the Labour Party is going to win this election. Okay, that that is that is that is a given. So, if it were very very marginal, you might you, you might be saying, well, it's essential to vote tactically or something like that. But for students, you know, you're young, you've got your whole lives ahead of you. You have to think, what sort of country do I want to live in for the next 50 or 60 years? Now, that seems a very long time, but you've got to ask yourself, what do I want to, what sort of country do I want? And you've got to ask yourself, is it the sort of country where we just have a Conservative Party, which is centre right, and a Labour mm -hmm. Party, which is centre left, and you just have a choice of two parties? Neither of them are particularly concerned about the environment, and on some as you know some areas they're very similar or am i you know do i want to live in a country that is a green party which is offering something different which is genuinely concerned about the environment which is genuinely saying we'd like to live in a country more like a scandinavian or continental country where there are higher taxes but there are much better public services and mm -hmm. if you want to live in that sort of country for the rest of your life you need a green party and you need to vote for the Green Party now, whether the Green Party gets lots of MPs or, as is more likely, gets relatively few MPs, you need to start building up the Green Party now. OK, thank you All very right, much. So that's that's what you've got to think about. Why Absolutely. me? You did. You said, why the party? Why me? I've, I've already said a little bit myself. I've lived in this area for 27 years. I know the area well. Uh, I don't know the University of Bath Spa particularly well, though I have visited it on a few occasions. I do understand higher education because I've been in it for the last 30 years. I understand the challenges. I understand what needs to be done. Um, you know, I teach, I teach students and I see the challenges they face. So I think I would be a good advocate for the higher education sector. Well, I think the, the Reform Party, I mean, it, in a way, what we're planning to do and what we're trying to do is what it says on the tin. We, we think that things need to be fixed and they need to be fixed, in my opinion, primarily in your interest, in your the interest of your demographic. Uh, I mean, I have uh, children who are now in their early 30s, late 20s. Um, and so I, you know, I know what it's like and I know what they're going through and I know, I know the challenges that they have. I mean, they've gone through university, but now they're in the situation of, well, can they afford to buy a property or where can they afford to live? Um, so uh, I'm, I mean, the, uh, I do have a personal interest in, in this, in the sense that I do have a, an interest in economic policy and I do have certain ideas about this that, you know, aren't even part of our platform. But I do, I do in principle think that, for example, in the future, if we want to really reform the economy, we have to reform how things like pensions are paid for and how long-term care is paid for um, and this actually is relevant to you because I, I'm kind of of the view that we're kind of on course for the social security system, as it were, to become bankrupt at some point, long before you retire. 
um, or long before you need healthcare. And so we really need to fix this sooner rather than later. My instinct is that, and this again, you know, is not our policy at the moment. We haven't, this has not been fleshed out, but my instinct is, and I, I think it'll get a favorable hearing from my colleagues in reform. My instinct is that we should introduce methods whereby younger people can save uh, into different kinds of funds, you know, funds for their healthcare and long-term healthcare, which would, they, would be their money. You could look at it online, it's your money. And also, obviously, for a, a workplace pension. We have a workplace pension in the UK, started by Nest. And so that, that's a good idea. But I suspect that some combination of reducing income tax rates and national insurance, but then mandating saving into funds like these two funds. So eventually the state becomes funded. Because, I mean, you, you, I presume you do know that all of the money that the government is destined to pay out on, in things like pensions and national, you know, for national insurance payments into interstate pensions, and of course, for things like long term health care, none of this has been pre funded. This money is not, it doesn't exist in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pot anywhere. So, we're, we're, you know, it's a recipe for national bankruptcy or at least inflation. And we're, we're having to borrow, you know, we're having to go on the on, on international markets and just borrow, borrow this money. Um, so, I would like to see maybe a way of doing it whereby you know, a cohort of people coming into the workplace would, would, would be able to have this new regime. This is my personal opinion. Um, and so you'd have a different regime. And eventually, when you were growing up and when you became, you know, into your 30s, 40s and 50s, the state would be pretty solvent at that point. Now, there would be arguments over how this would work. Um, you know, that there are several sums and mathematical things to be done in order to actually make a case for this. But I think in principle, it's 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 a good idea, and I think it is supported by quite a few economists around the world. Well, I think a, a fairly key selling point for us is I, we're the only party that says we will get rid of student uh, fees and loans, and ultimately we'll write off student debt. I mean, if if you're thinking entirely of the amount immense amount of debt that you're going to be in, sadly, um, then you know even if it's an entirely selfish vote, then a green vote makes sense because we're going to write that debt off. Um, but I'd like people to think a bit more beyond that and about, the as I was saying in my last answer, the society they want to live in and whether we want a society where the, especially the arts, but all graduates to a certain extent are demonised and sort of it's almost like freeloaders. You know, you talk, you hear this sort of messaging coming out of the Tories and it's it's about students, oh, they're all slack, we should make them work harder. And then when they're not attacking students, they're attacking universities as some sort of awful place where people can protest about things and we should crack down on that. It's just toxic stuff. And as a party, we are entirely about free, free thought and education being a good thing. And if you are a student, there's, as I say, there's the financial side where we don't want to cripple people with debt. And also we want people to be free to express themselves and free to learn whatever they want. And we don't want to censor that. We don't want to coerce the, the population to do what we want. I mean, I, I have a very strong, um, I'm old, as I say, but I have a strong sort of feeling of, of unity with students. I was a student for seven years. You know, I, I, I did a degree and I did a PhD and, and then I did OU degrees, actually. So I've been a student for part time longer. And that was all for me free, not only free, but I got paid a grant. I, I finished my degree and my PhD um, with no debt. You know, and when I say that to students now and they say, oh, you know, that, that we can't even imagine a world where you come out with no debt. But it's it's entirely possible. You know, Britain is an outlier. I say Britain, actually Scotland's different, but England and Wales, it's an outlier. We we have the most expensive universities almost in the world. Maybe they're yeah, actually in the world, I don't know. But you know, we're kind of hovering around those really it's not necessary. We're one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We could choose to fund education. And as far as I can see, it's only the Greens in England, in England at least, saying that actually education should be free to be using it because we all benefit. And so Voting for us will not only make your financial lives easier, but I think will just lead to a happier society where education is valued. Well, this is this is what makes, you know, uh, once you if, if you go and read the contract. So the contract is our manifesto. We call it a contract. The reason why reform call it a contract is to say oh, we want to be held to this. This is not just waffle, because governments have been voted in on manifestos that they then ignore, which is crazy. And they, you know, and people just carry on voting for them, like, like literally, like herds of sheep. 
they'll just be, people are tribal when it comes to their voting. You can't be like you can't afford to be like that. So reform, uh, the only party is the only manifesto, the contract that that talks about how to make this country richer. All the other parties are talking about how to tax more. And taxation is a form of wealth redistribution. But every time you redistribute wealth, every time you tax it, you lose a percentage of that money because somebody has got to handle it. In our case, it's the civil service. And the government is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and everything. Oh, well, we've got to tax that. Oh, we've got to tax that. Oh, we've got to have regulations about this. Oh, yeah, please, let's have some more regulations. This is what's tying us down. And we cannot... I was talking to somebody, right? Uh, one of my supporters, he's into drones. He develops them. Right, we're talking stuff we all need to be up to date with. And he was telling me about all the obstacles and the regulations. I said, Well, how come? He said, We're not far from having a drone deliver your pizza. I said, Well, which is great because that will free the streets up. You know, for if you get well, you know, if pizza is so damn important to people, at least at least let's do it in a way that does that that doesn't clog up the streets and people can go about their business. I said, but how come? And and they're using drones to deliver drugs in prisons, which they do. He said, because criminals are not tied down by rules and regulations. You see what I, so it's like the criminals are free to be inventive, whereas our inventors and our greatest minds are busy going through paperwork and ticking boxes. So there must be a way to simplify all this. You know, we I'm not a party. I'm not a colour. And and that's that's a that was a personal choice a long time ago that I just felt the tribalism. You know, we've we've been brought up, I think, um, and, and you guys are starting that adult life journey, but um, brought up to vote. We it's a democratic right, and uh, and part of the wrestle we've got at the moment is what choice have we got, um, and and are we being represented, and and are they genuinely conducting business in parliament that that reflects how the country feels are they doing it for for different reasons and you know the chaos of the last few years post covid has been dramatic on all of us um and people were saying to me they feel politically homeless people felt unable to genuinely engage in the process because that they might have been one thing or thought well I, i've got views in that side i've got views in that side but then they look at the detail and go, I, I can't relate to half of that. And, and I don't like some of the characters because I've seen how they've been acting or I've seen how they're doing. And that's why I decided to put, throw my hand in, in for this because I, I'm experienced. I've had that time here on a local level representing um, the community. I've got that experience of going in and scrutinising. I've called in a number of decisions that have been made by the local council to say, is that the right thing? And was it the right thing? Um, you know, and I think that's really important to to not have a party line to toe because um, sometimes people toe a party line and they're saying things that aren't relevant to us. You know, our experiences are different than inner city Birmingham. They'll be different than, than rural North Lancashire. And I think that's why I believe for, for the students here at, um, at Bath Spa and uh, Uni of Bath, a local representative who understands their campuses and their needs is, is a better representative than somebody from a party. What top three challenges you think face students right now? Ah, oh, right. Okay, well, the top three challenges... I would say actually are around that future employment, that 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 fear about what what am I going to do when I finished um, finished my education, um, and so we need to to work more with with students um, and indeed our partners across the the area. Um, you know, I spoke about building new green industries, but there will be other areas that we can we can be working with as well and I think we also need to be thinking about how you know perhaps if you've got a degree in you know uh, creative uh, creative subject how that fits with other um, types of work I, I know from my um, from previously when I was the leader of the council I was talking to lots of business leaders who really wanted people who had that creative mind um, to, to work 
with them because it, that sort of demonstrated that ability to you know think outside the box to be creative to uh, you know and that was a skill that um they they really wanted to to capitalize on so it's, it's, i think it's about how do we work um to ensure that people get the best opportunities um, and that recognizes the work that they've already put in. Um, so that was a, the first one. I think, as I said, around um, the cost of living, I think mental health, you know, these are, and the environment, so that's more than three. I feel, I, I, I was listening to a um, pro, God, was, uh, God was Well the other day and um, yeah, there were some very cheeky answers where they didn't just give their top one plant. <laughs> Um, so one of the challenges that, that, that students face, uh, of course, is, is student fees. Um, the Green Party is committed to removing student fees, and this will take longer, sorting out the, the debt that, that you know, recent students have, have incurred. <clears throat> but student fees at the moment, of course, as students, those are fees that you're going to pay back in the future. I think the most urgent things facing students from, from my interaction with students are, first of all, is accommodation. Lots of universities have expanded. They haven't expanded student accommodation in line with the number of students. Students have to live long distances. They have to live in houses, which are really designed to be family homes, but have been poorly converted. Um, it's not really fair on the students living in those homes, it's not really fair on the families who, who don't have families to live in, uh, you know, homes to live in. Um, so I think um, really universities need to step up to the plate and provide much better accommodation for their students. Um, the next thing I'd say is cost of living, just many students struggling to find enough money to pay their, their, current, um, their current outgoings. So this is completely different from student fees. It's just hand to mouth existence. Many students having to take on part-time jobs, that means then they struggle to complete their studies. I frequently have students who miss classes or lectures or who struggle with deadlines because, because of the pressure they're under to, to, um, to earn extra money. Uh, and basically we, we need to say if somebody's studying, um, certainly during term time, they should not be under pressure to take on part-time work. I mean, part-time work or even full-time work over the long vacation is good because it builds up work experience. But having to stack shelves in, in, you know, in a supermarket uh, and therefore missing a lecture is not what a student wants. And then the final thing I'd say, you asked for three challenges, so let me give you the three. You know, I'm aware that many students are struggling uh, with mental health. I have a lot of students that tell me this um, to my face, and then obviously we have various procedures to ensure confidentiality, but I know the numbers of students that are anonymously um, <clears throat> um, telling our staff. And, you know, I'm conscious that mental health provision in the National Health Service is very poor. Uh, partly those mental health problems are driven by the problems with accommodation and the problems with cost of living, uh, but they're also driven by other things. And we need to have massive improvement in mental health care. The Green Party is the only party offering significant increases in spending on the National Health Service. Um, you know, National Health Service spending is over £200 billion a year. Other parties offering increases of 1% or 2%. Uh, this is barely in line with inflation. The Green Party is, is offering a bigger increase in healthcare spending and an investment so that we can start to improve services. That won't feed through immediately, but it will to the extent that we are also attaching value to mental health uh, care, that will benefit students. I, I'll try and give you a, um, an entertaining one, maybe. Uh, <laughs> or maybe entertaining. I think, I mean, okay, apart from the economic challenges that confront younger people, I think there is, I think you have grown up in an era of um, organized and indeed institutionalized um, anxiety. Um, and I don't think, I, I think a large part of the mental health issues that young people face are a product, not only of some vague sense of economic insecurity, and obviously we're dealing with, you know, as, as Jonathan Haidt, the American psychologist talks about, we're dealing with uh, social media 
Um, and in particular, he relates this, in fact, to teenage girls um, and social media, who, who he says as a, as, a, as a demographic and a gender tend to respond and interact slightly differently with it than, say, teenage boys. Um, and so we're in a kind of an age of anxiety. And we're also in an age where I think um, students and young younger people have been brought up through a school system and a, a third level system that's very focused on um, concepts of ideas of oppression, ideas of, of, of harm. Uh, there has been a kind of a concept creep, um, I think, from, from psychology into politics to this extent. And so, so, so you know, this is, a, this is a common thing on American campuses. I'm sure it is probably on, on, on a lot of UK campuses, whereby, you know, hearing views that you disagree with, you know, you, you feel like this, this is violence. Or, or it triggers something, you know, uh, and this 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 makes people quite fragile. And I like the idea of of younger people being uh, robust, being able to stand their corner, you know, defend their politics. I'm all in favor of that. Uh, I have a son. He's he's just over thirty now, and who is uh, he claims to be a Marxist, and he he gives me hell. <laughs> Um, you know, it's just, uh, and, and he has a lot of detail at his fingertips, you know, so he gives me a very hard time. So I have to, I have to do homework when I argue with him. Um, so I think in that sense, there has been a kind of a blending or a kind of a concept creep between people's views of political events, for example, or events in the world and their own sense of their own mental health. And so it's like an infinity pool, you know, there's an infinity pool between the, uh, the, the, the space of the student, of the undergraduate. Um, and it's partly maybe what they're learning in, in, in their courses, um, but they, they have the sense of, of not really distinguish between, be, distinguishing between their own sense of well-being and the wider problems. I want to talk about the money again, but I mean, the, the huge amounts of debt, obviously that's a problem. And, and people will just sort of dismiss it saying, oh, well, it, you won't have to pay it back anyway. But that's not that's not the right way of thinking about it because even if you don't manage to repay it, you're still paying a month, you know, every month you're paying more than somebody who didn't do it. So it's costing you money and that money is, you can't spend on other things. And with the house, uh, the, the cost of housing and stuff at the moment, uh, you know, everyone needs all the money they can get. Graduates are not earning huge amounts of money. I mean, just to put things in perspective, when, when I graduated, well, when I started work, which was two, the year 2000, um, I started on 25K. Uh, which at the time was a kind of average graduate salary. And that was in Bath. So if I'd gone to London, I could have earned more. And now graduates are starting on about the same, <laughs> you know, which is it's crazy. You know, it, doing a degree does not necessarily, not all graduates, obviously if you do some financing, you probably earn loads, but, but you know, um, some earn less, you know, so I, I'm, you know, I, at the time mine was kind of middle really for, for I, you know, I did computer science. So it was kind of, it was less than I could have earned. But I thought Bath's a nice place to live. But but now, you know, I hear people in my industry, so it's not just graduates, graduates in general, they're earning the same or a bit less than I am 20 years ago. It's just crazy. Um, so that's because obviously society in general, there's pay has not kept pace with inflation. It's not just graduates, it's everyone, you know, especially if you work in the public sector. It's really dropped behind. So there's the huge amounts of debt, but it's not coupled with an increase in what you can expect to start earning as a graduate so those those are big problems for graduates because the wage is not going up it's, that's a problem for everyone but if you're a graduate you also have a huge amount of debt and yeah maybe you don't start repaying it to you sit a, to you hit a certain amount of earnings but it's still sat there and it's earning up it's generating interest and these days i mean when when they were brought in student loans the promise was that you'd only ever pay base rate interest on them which was great. But now, obviously, well, you know what it's like. Right? You're paying some huge amount of money and some private company, because I don't think the debts are owned by the government anymore. They outsource them all. So some companies making a huge amount of money on that debt. Um, it's just even if even if you never repay it, it's hanging over you. That's not good for your mental health. So sure, in a perfect world where, where everyone was earning loads more, that wouldn't be such a problem. But it's, it's just a massive problem now. And then you're going to a workplace where I'm going to be a bit negative here, so I do apologise because I'm, I'm pretty old, right? So I don't have to worry about the upcoming AI apocalypse. But there's a lot of people now, and then I say this in all seriousness, I think AI 
and the rate it's improving is going to just decimate the job market. Um, now, you could argue that's good or bad. I don't think in itself AI doing this is a bad thing. The bad thing is that the wealth that's generated is not going to be shared equally unless we really, really change society. And I have to say, it, unless the Greens fantastically win the general election, I don't think um, society is going to be reshaped that well. We People aren't talking about this, but we need things like a universal basic income. We need much heavier taxation on the people earning the money from the AI. Because at the moment, you're training to do, and this is especially true of jobs that require degrees or any, any kind of um, any kind of office job, let's say, but also artistic jobs. I mean, I'm sure anyone doing, doing an arts degree has kept an eye on all the sort of the music and the art and stuff that AI is generating. And yeah, sometimes it's not very good, but it gets so much better every every six months. You know, so we're talking about, in my view, AI is going to be to the point where it can do the stuff people do on commission. So let's say you do music and um, you do sync music. So a TV show wants to, you know, wants you to write a soundtrack for a, a soap opera or something. At the moment, that's not a bad little income for musicians, you know, they, um, but that's the first thing that's going to go to sync. You know, the, the producer of the TV program will go, right, write me a tune that does this, that and the other, and the AI will output it. And that's a, that's just tragic news for people who want to make money with music. And it's the same with any art. Arts are going to be something that you do with as a passion that you can't depend on for a regular income. And we have to think as a society of what we're going to do about that. You know, how are, how are artists going to be paid? But equally, how are anyone who does any kind of office job going to be paid? Ultimately, the only people who, who don't have to worry about this for now are people who have a trade, like plumbers and electricians and stuff. But everyone else, everyone else's jobs are at, at risk. So it, I say that <laughs> as a challenge that faces students. It faces everyone, but it especially faces students because you guys are still young. And, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way. You, you've got your whole working lives ahead of you. And this would be looming on the horizon, you know, and we really have to address it and we have to start addressing it now. We have to let people know that their, their financial future, especially with all these huge debts, you know, we, we have to, because it's just going to be weighing down. It's, 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 it's going to lead to all sorts of mental health issues, I think, when, you know, all, the, all these jobs that have been around forever just disappear. And that's what's going to happen. I mean, I don't want to sound negative, but it's going to happen. So is it, that's about a bit of a downer to end that question on. <laughs> They're the challenges, I think. So debt is the biggest, I think, challenge because it's going to have a knock-on effect on when you marry, if you marry, if you're going to have kids. You might be in your 30s by the time you decide to have kids. So I had my first one at 24 when I was still a student, funnily enough. <laughs> it wasn't uh, it wasn't particularly planned uh, so but i survived you know and it, he did well and i did well and and we worked around it and you know but the second one i had in my early 30s and even in my early 30s i thought you know what i'd be a better granny at this stage rather than a mum i felt that <laughs> what i'm saying is it, uh, and I had elderly parents. My parents had me at 40. So I'm now 57. So at, the, at my age, my mom had a teenage daughter, you know, which the mind boggles. Uh, she was a very she was a very energetic woman. So she, she was very young in her mind. So she could cope with me. But what I'm saying is a lot of people postpone having a family. A lot of women postpone having a family. And it's not always possible later on. The risks are higher in terms of conditions, the risk that you take with your personal health. Um, it's it's best not to. There's nothing that stops you from having a baby when you're younger. You can work around studies and work and, and all of this. So, you know, this debt, you could end up waking up at the age of 50 and realizing that your student debt affected the whole course of your life. Majorly. So debt is your number one thing. The other thing is your employability. You're, you've got to look at, you've got to keep your eye on the prize. You're not going through this for the laughs. You shouldn't be going through this for the laughs. You should, you should have some laughs along the way. But your prize is what you're going to do after. You know, you can't all be reporters. You can't all be funky art designer, whatever. You know, whatever it is, you got to look. What is it the employers want from me? 
How have I got that? You know, so whatever it is you're doing, pair it up with something practical. During your holidays, maybe not go and work uh, for a £12 an hour job. Maybe give yourself voluntarily uh, to a business to learn a trade, you know, to actually work in an actual setting where money is generated. Where do you start? Um, yeah, where do you start? I, I mean, rent, rent values is, is, a, is a massive one and availability of suitable uh, and affordable. That isn't just a, a student problem. I mean, it's a, it is a massive problem in, in, in Bath itself. Um, you know, I was talking to our social housing provider only a week or so ago, just really understanding their pressures. You know, they house over one in 10 of Bain's residents. They, they operate over 13,000 properties. You know, some of those are grade one, grade two listed. You know, it's a whole gambit of of issues and, and having somebody who houses students. You know, when we do a work experience program and you're coming in from Germany for, for your six months, we make sure we book them a room in a, in, a, in a house share. The bills are paid and everything else doesn't stop you having to deal with the 120 year old Victorian house that might have a condensation issue or whatever. It, it's it's a wrestle housing and rent values is probably one I'd put in your top three. Um, but ultimately, is it me? I'm, my job is to ask you guys what your problems are. Uh, and and so I might have a list, but I thought, what are the things I do I shout about on your behalf first? I think I think debt is a massive hangover. And th that's a, yeah, dare I say, a, a long term legacy. Um, and, and how are we going to deal with that one? You know, I've got two two children going through that the sort of senior school education and and I'm a massive believer in work experience you know I, I chose not to go into higher education I was one of those itchy kids who couldn't wait to get out of the classroom um and that doesn't suit but we've we've engendered this thing if you've got to go 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 you go go to union is that the right choice for everybody so part of that is understanding debt and understanding how people are not only going to cope with that but are going to aspire to the the jobs and opportunities that their education that they've they've paid quite royally for is going to afford them um so but you as i said you might tell me that that isn't in your top three priorities um you know I, it, it's it's difficult for me to go down the list and look at, at further things and name them specifically because everyone has a different experience and you know you've got thousands of, of fellow students up on campus and if you talked to 10 you might get a different three answers from from each of those 10 so i'd like just to say that's what an independent is we try and listen first we try and understand what those are and then try and prioritize because ultimately i believe politics should be about we, we will always have a gambit and a spectrum of opinion but unless we garner that opinion and, and, and bring it together and communicate and engage, we won't find the middle ground that says this is what we need to represent. Um, and that's that. Oh, my apologies. That's that. How do we how do we. Um, yeah. Politics dictates a lot. And, and I don't feel that's right. So, um, yeah, in terms of top three, I, ho I hope I'm, I'm not dodging your last bit of the question because I, I genuinely think I, I, I could list it. And one of your one of your viewers might be going, oh, no, he missed that one. So I don't want to miss any. Of them. I take them all seriously. So what would you do on a positive note to improve higher education for the university student experience? OK, well, obviously, I've, I've <laughs> said sometimes that I would build that that um, or create that that body, that um, informative um group to to tell me what what is important to students um i would want to work with the student community partnership as well around some of those issues around housing um and around um the sort of like um base level environmental issues you know recycling and those sorts of things um you know i, I would want to work with the universities themselves around how we can be work together so that you've got the representatives in Westminster that are really understanding the needs of of the of the of the future of that future generation that's coming through and and hearing from them about how we can improve society for for everybody. I think I've said said some things you know that the Green Party has policies on housing yeah it has policies 
uh, which will start to benefit students as we bring more houses on track. Um, we shall also, um, uh, you know, be improving mental health service provision. But uh, I mean, one of our more eye-catching things for, for current students um, and future students is that we wish to get rid of student fees. That is that is one of you know that's our big manifesto commitment. It will not be cheap, uh, and it won't be particularly easy. But our aim is to remove student fees. Um, and as I said, and the second thing is that for, for students at the moment, I mean, if you know, if, I don't know exactly which year you're in, but probably it's too late for us to cut your fees because you've already paid them. But you will have you will have a debt. It is not our highest priority, but it is one of our priorities to re, to sort out that debt and to reduce it. But I've got to be realistic. We can't rewrite contracts, you know, um, arbitrarily and quickly. Legal contracts, financial contracts need to be need to be thought through. It's one of our priorities, but it's not our highest priority. So there are our things: cut student fees, reintroduce maintenance grants. I mean, I think. Um, I do have opinions about the politicization of university courses. Um, and, and, and I mean really the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and, I, and that's really a question about content. Now, what could I do about that? I don't know. I think we, we live in an intellectual milieu where um, we, are, we are sort of decolonizing things. And uh, I think you, you're probably both familiar with Edward Said, the great um, um, founder of post-colonial theory, really, and a very brilliant man. Uh, but I disagreed with Said um, in the sense that I think, he, you know, he, th th there has been a kind of a post-colonial, post-colonial, post-colonialization of many university courses, which I disagree with. Now, what do I do about that? I'm not sure if I can do anything about that. I think, um, I think that the intellectual milieu, though, is not is not necessarily in your favour, um, and this may this may become more apparent later on. Um, I would like to see um, freedom of speech be more protected on campuses. I think I think people who are conservatives on campus are silenced. They do hide themselves away, um, and they do often feel intimidated. And I think I think you know if if people are coming on campus and you don't agree with them, show up. And, and 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 you know argue with them. Um, uh, it, I remember once years ago I, I ran a think tank uh, in Ireland and I, I was asked a question, um, and it was it was really concerning sort of the problem of racism uh, in society. And I and I said something. It was slightly theatrically. I said it in a slightly theatrical way. Um, uh, uh, it involved a pause, and I, I said to the to the. Um, it was at the Trinity College Dublin Historical Society, Debating Society in Trinity, Dublin. And I said, uh, I said, the real problem with racism is not that it's wrong. And I paused. <laughs> and I said, the real problem with racism is that it's not true. It's not true, right? So in other words, people expressing any opinions that are, are racist against particular groups are a bit like people arguing, you know, that witches exist. Um, and should be attacked. It's it's you know the first the first thing to understand is that's not true, and then you then you argue with them, then you oppose them on the basis that you know it's not true. A lot of people are, are default into a, a a sort of a, a tribal response. They say, well, that's really bad. This person is bad, and I'm going to fight them because they're bad. And actually, I think I think people who often say things that we might think are racist, they've got other things going on in their life. You know, they have some other economic pressure going on so first of all what they're saying is not true and then take them up on it and and drill into it and 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 change their minds change their minds tell them they're wrong and tell them why they're wrong um there is a sort of a sense of over alarmism in our society i think identity politics has not been good for us um that's and that and that in a way in in that opinion i'm probably running counter to quite a lot of just you know default opinion amongst university students who, who kind of have a default view that, um, you know, we are fighting social injustice and anybody who is, is in, in any sense, you know, in any sense, not exactly stating our party line about subjects like this is, is suspect. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of, I, I always stood with Martin Luther King, I was standing with Martin Luther King on this kind of stuff. You know, it, it, we, we have, I mean, 
we identity politics, I think, in general, has not been good for us. And and so that is a kind of a challenge. And it's been my concern is that it's been taken into uh, the workplace and in, into the world of politics, and that there's a danger that what it leads to is a kind of balkanization of society. And so I would, you know, I would I would l urge you to look at, you know, the, our current politics and just consider that that maybe identity politics is is not I mean people like Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in the 60s would not have recognized identity politics they wouldn't have recognized it they would have thought we were bonkers you know um but it's an interesting it's an interesting subject and probably for further discussion so sh should I be elected you can always drag me back and force me to explain myself <laughs> should be and university should be working out what you need to do you know when it comes to lectures to get that degree not what feels like good value for money because the reality is different degrees cost different amounts of money to deliver you know if you're doing some super advanced physics degree and you need some whizzy labs or whatever you that's going to cost way more than it costs to do creative writing for example because you know ultimately then you're the only cost there is people's time and time is expensive but it's you know it's time whereas if you need some sort of super amazing laser or something then that might cost tens of thousands of pounds so i think that's why any kind of thinking about the money is just misguided um so i think if universities didn't have to do that that would just naturally improve the experience for, for the students because you wouldn't you you can't help but pick up on the fact that the university is worried about money and that might be as simple as in them talking about what they have to do and why they're justifying not giving you lectures or whatever and especially during covid i mean you probably i don't know if you missed that I don't, i'm not very good at judging age but <laughs> but um but that was a nightmare for everyone um and of course just the fees made it so much worse because when when i was back looking back to when i was a student if that had happened to me i'd have gone well this is really annoying but i'm not paying for it so it's not quite so bad whereas I, it just adds an element of just the of marketization to an educational experience, which I don't think is appropriate. Um, but and then that goes to things like halls. You know, you get universities now charging an absolute fortune for halls, and and then even worse, these companies that have sprung up these sort of private halls you get all around Bath, for example. I'm sure you've seen them, or maybe you've even lived in one. I don't know. That's the thing that never used to happen because now you get all of these sort of slightly parasitic companies that know exactly how much money students get in their loans and then they charge them as much as they can and you know it, it's just the whole thing seems to be extracting that money from students and again i hate to go on about money because actually being a student is much more is much more about not just about money it's about loads of other things but it's such a significant part now that you, you can't ignore it um but experience you know Generally, I, I think I still think I, I believe going to university is one of one is one of the best things people can do if it's if it's something they want to do. I think it's an amazing experience. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. I think it's a great opportunity for people who might have never lived away from home to go and meet people from all over, you know, could be from anywhere all over the world, all over the country, get to just think about the thing they're interested in the most. And I think this is why. I was saying earlier about everyone should just do the degree they, they find the most interesting. I think the most the most important thing is to not do what society is telling you you have to do to earn money. The thing to do is to study the thing you are interested in. And luckily for me, I did computer science, which is a nerd subject, which now people do because they think it'll earn them a good salary. But when I did it, the only people who did it were proper nerds, you know, people who were really interested in it. And it was, a, it was an amazing atmosphere of everyone talking about a thing that they were interested in. And it doesn't matter what that thing is. That thing could be creative writing or it could be anything, you know. But if you're in a room full of like-minded people, that experience is something you'll probably never get again in life unless you're lucky. And it's something that people don't talk about enough. I, you know, as, as a party, we want education to be something that is just an amazing thing, an amazing experience that's going to help shape your life rather than a thing, a transactional thing about getting a job. And even if, you know, even if you don't get a job in that thing, you it, you still want to leave thinking that was an amazing three years or an amazing four years. Uh, and now I have to go and be an accountant or whatever. But, you know, <laughs> that's life, hopefully not. But um, I don't know, I've, 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 I've gone on again about roughly the same sort of stuff, but I think the experience, it's, it's all about knowing that this is a, a, such a great time 
to just specialize in a thing that you're interested in and it's it's just a way to expand yourself as a as a human um and i think everything we do as a party is about ex enhancing life rather than enhancing business and i think it's just a different mindset it's a different way of looking at the world because ultimately if everything is about money you're going to be sad <laughs> ultimately because you can never have enough if money is all you care about you can never have enough of it it's about making life worth living obviously you need enough money to live but once you're past that point it's about making life worth living well i i, I would i would um the employability is the skills it's the skills uh i, I think of course if you can uh, there's nothing wrong with studying dance or drama or uh, there's obviously all these things are valuable uh, beyond words but i think most young people go on to a degree because they like the subject they don't spend one minute thinking about about what job they're going to get after so it's got to be focused studying you've got to um you know the, this they're the long term it's a, what is it going to ev evolve into uh one of my son's friends he did uh, radio and media and he's now working for the mod so he would you know a, a perfectly valuable job but not what he studied for so um, he was a clever boy. He was an intelligent chap, which is, but but maybe his three years at university could have been better used. You know, so employability is the main thing, and and the other thing, as a as an individual, I would very much uh, encourage everyone to have more than one string in their bow. So, don't just study one thing. You need a lot of skills to survive. It's an ever, uh, an, an increasingly complicated world. Uh, for instance, with, without IT, you're dead in the water. You know, so you can study whatever you want, but unless your website is good, nobody's going to choose you. You know, <laughs> you, uh, you know, you, this is this is the this is the reality of the the fact. That's where the advertising has moved to. They don't do billboards anymore. It's all online. It's all it's all um, computer IT related. So you've got to have more than one string in your bow. You've got to be flexible. Have a backup plan. Okay. Always have a, always okay. have a backup plan. Private sector involved. I'd get the private sector. They, they, it, I don't know what employers want. The employers know what they want. So when I say get them involved, um, they can even sponsor if they want. They could sponsor somebody particularly talented. But the, the main thing is there's got to be, that's where the conversation needs to be happening. Not between you and me, but it is between you and your future employers. You, you know, that's where they got, that's what the student union should be doing. You know, not, not, not about Gaza. Not that I'm not saying you shouldn't have an opinion on Gaza. Go for it. But the point is, Gaza is not going to affect your future directly. You're a student. The student's union, you pay fees. You're a member of a union. That union should be looking at your we rights. Don't charge. It's, it's all free for our students to join our union. Is it free? Yeah. You know, you know what they say about that, don't you? Do you know what they say? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's paying for all that. So you need, you know, the, the other thing they say, I used to hate that saying, but it turns out actually it's right, which is follow the money, follow the money. When you follow the money, you'll see who's behind something. There's no, so you can't have such a massive organization running on fresh air. In reform, everybody criticizes reform though, or the party of millionaires. I don't know what Farage is, is a millionaire, but I know that reform the party. They, they, we've got, you know, we're a brand new party. We're a grassroots organization. I pay for my campaign. Every leaflet I post through a door, some guy came out and said, "Oh, I don't want this." I said, "I'll have it back." I said, "I've paid for it. <laughs> I'll stick it in the next door." So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's paying for it. That's who you need to be looking at, you know. So the unions should be representing you, and they should be opening that conversation with employers. Okay. Okay. So, um, like that's what you feel we should do. Um, what would you do to improve higher education? You would facilitate these conversations. 
Well, that, that would be something I'd, I'd want to look at as an individual, yeah. The, the reform policy on, on higher education is to reduce the number of what they call Mickey Mouse degrees. So degrees that don't have a very high standing, that basically all they're going to give you is the debt and very little employability at the other end. I just think, you know, if somebody, for instance, is well off, they come from a, a comfortable background, they're not desperate to get a decent job after uni and they just want to study something for the interest of it, then that's fine. But other jobs, you know, nursing uh, and, you know, with doctors, we produce enough doctors, but, you know, we lose them. They go abroad to work. So we export our doctors from Britain in order to import other doctors from elsewhere. It's mad. So, you know, we, we need to look at that retaining our talent and, and stopping that brain drain. Yes. Yeah. If I had a magic wand or could I be real about it? <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, it, it's I think it goes back to your last question in, in terms of what is the priority for each individual student and and it's hard to pick an individual thing of what would you improve if it was a magic wand hey let's take away tuition fees you know let, let's put that on an even footing and and give us that opportunity to allow people to choose the education and learn through that education another thing that i would do if I'm honest, is you know my experience with our international cousins and how their degree structures are slightly different. You know we have that potential of the gap year or the the year in industry in some of our degrees. You go and look at colleagues doing similar courses in Germany or Spain or or, or Italy. They're often doing a four or five year bachelor's, but they will have two one or two six month work experiences actually weaved into the program. That work experience is a really good opportunity to, to bridge. And sometimes people come away going, oh, God, I don't I don't like this. Why, why am I doing this? And that's not a bad outcome because it's better to do that and start challenging that earlier than actually getting to that end of the degree going, I've had enough of this and I've got all that debt and now I've got to think again. Um, so, so maybe personally, that's an area that I think um, should be looked at, but think things in education curriculums are fairly deeply entrenched <laughs> you know i have different views on the vocational level of, of dual systems and apprenticeships that have, we see in other countries um but our politicians have meddled quite a lot with our education and uh, i think it's it's better time to listen to the experts within education and and deliver the results that they need how many hours a week do you think our students work according to our study that we did in 2022 hmm I would say between about 16 and 25 hours. Uh, I must admit, I don't know that number to hand. Uh, I understand okay. significant numbers of students are doing 15 to 20 hours part time. Uh, it may vary between universities. Uh, I, I teach yeah. at a university that may have uh, a higher proportion of better off students. And so it may be maybe lower. Um, so I can't, I, but I'm not, I don't have that number to hand and I'm not going to pretend I do. Um, see, I, this is the tricky one because um, I guess it would depend on how wealthy they were when they, when they started university, right? 100%. And, and uh, I don't want to generalise, but the average student going to Bath is wealthier than the average student going to Bath's Bar, uh, quite noticeably <laughs> when you go and look around. Um, I don't know. I, hours worked. Yeah, because I did work when I was a student, um, but not a lot, not a lot. I didn't need to, um, but much more than about 20 hours a week would have made studying awkward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for 20 hours. It, it, yeah, it's interesting because I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of people engaging and, and doing those individual bits, uh, going back with friends sort of 40 years ago doing that stacking shelves in Sainsbury's because it made the ends meet and they could afford to go out and do the nightclub or whatever uh, and I think that's that's healthy and it's good um but it's getting their balance uh, and I think certain people feel forced into that you know the, the students that will come through my program they they now have to have visas that's another government stroke of genius um and but within that they are allowed up to work up to 20 hours per week um in a separate job for from a, a monetary point of view and i think that flexibility is important but it's got to be balanced 
every degree also is different of how much how much actual lecture or or, or, or on campus time there is and that will vary from from study program to study program i'm told um, but i'm too old i haven't been back for a long time to be in so. <laughs> This is close to the mark. So 22 hours on average, a student's working, but it's not just to earn like pocket money. It's usually, or it's often for oh. rents and for food and transport, like, um, because yeah, ends aren't meeting like, so I just like, I'm really passionate about making everybody aware of how hard our students are working aside from their full-time degrees. Like it's, it's just and working so many hours in a week. It's trying to get the balance. And I, I do believe that, that that contribution, that commitment to, to working some of those hours is good and it's it's good experience, but it is getting that balance right um, yeah, because that, that that also compounds that mental uh, well-being state, the, the, the stress, the anxiety that both financially but also those hours can cause. For sure.